Hey friends, welcome back to another episode of Space for Life. As usual, we have what I would specifically call an extraordinary guest today, and I think that will come with some new meaning as you get to know my guest, uh, Robert White. And let me kind of position this episode a few episodes back in Space for Life. I recorded one that I called Find a Mentor, Be a Mentor, and kind of exposed one of my passions in life, which is mentoring, because I just see that growth doesn't happen in a vacuum. Now, we we have limited ability to grow without the input of incredible people in our life. And it's also important to to try to be that incredible person for other people, hence the episode, Find a Mentor, Be a Mentor. So today, I think Robert is one that you will find that I'm going to find and have already found is someone that even though we don't know each other well, we're just getting to know one another, he is that step beyond that I talk about in that episode of so many places that I'm interested in going. And I think you'll see that. And I think we're going to find some incredible wisdom and podcast and reading books are tremendous ways to ha- almost have a remote mentoring type of relationship where we can learn from people who are further along the way than us. So I think this episode is going to be uh, a great learning experience for for me as he uh, shares so many of his experiences in the different places that that I'm entering into in this season of life. And I think is going to be a place for a lot of us to learn so much about. So, Robert, welcome. I'll introduce you, but welcome, first of all, to Space for Life. It's wonderful to be with you, Tommy. Well, thanks so much. So let me give just a quick little bio, and then I'm going to ask you to uh, share a lot more about your story, because I think that just uh, gives color to everything that we'll talk about in more depth beyond. But Robert founded and led training industry success stories, LifeSpring, ARC International, and most currently, Extraordinary People. This blew me away with over 1.3 million graduates from their high-impact experiential trainings. 1.3 million. I can't even fathom that number, but it's amazing. He's worked in Tokyo, Hong Kong, and mainland China for a total of 21 years. Robert's authored the essays for the award-winning photo journal, One World, One People, and is author of Living an Extraordinary Life. And I love that word, extraordinary. Living an Extraordinary Life, Unlocking Your Potential for Success, Joy, and Fulfillment. And I love the combination of those three words because that is something, success, joy, and fulfillment, that I think really captures the breadth of what so many people are looking for in the best of what they imagine for life. Uh, Audiophile Magazine awarded Robert's Audio Home Study Program, Achieving Extraordinary Success, its Earphones Award for Best Spoken Word Personal Development Program. Robert White utilizes extraordinary entrepreneurial success in working with executives to develop extraordinary personal leadership skills, focus, alignment, and commitment. So we have a lot to talk about. And one of one of the places, certainly, I'm sure we're going to dive into that word that will be used a lot on this podcast, extraordinary. It's a great word. And it's a word that is probably scary to a lot of people, uncomfortable to a lot of people. And I'd love to dive into that also. But perhaps first of all, in, in reading a little bit of the behind-the-scenes bio uh, of you, Robert, extraordinary is probably not the expected place that came from the early years of your life. So I'd love if you'd just share your life story kind of leading to this place that we're at now, because I think it will give a tremendous context for everybody listening to this. Oh, thank you, Tommy. I, I'm old enough to have experienced a lot, I guess. And uh, which is, it's kind of like, I remember back in the day when people would go on a vacation and come back with the pictures and slide and have a slide projector, you know, <laughs> first kind of internet, that was the worst kind of internet of invitation. 
you could ever get. So talking about myself for 45 minutes, it sounds pretty boring. So maybe a couple of turning points in my life. It, it is true that I was born into a pretty dysfunctional family of, of poverty and abuse. I left home at 14 when my father died and of a learning. First of all, I'd been entrepreneurial from like six or seven years old. I cut grass in the summer. I shoveled walks in the winter. I sold magazine subscriptions door to door. I had a paper route, of course, and things like that. My worst job was scraping chewing gum off the sidewalks at a Dairy Queen in midsummer. That's one that's an experience you never forget. But right around the time the period where my father died, I had secured a job in radio as a what they call a control engineer. So I was the guy that supported an announcer by playing records, by putting on commercials, by coming an hour early to turn on the transmitter. You know, the early days or earlier days of radio. And and then that migrated into being an on-air personality. And at 17, several things happened for me. One was that I graduated from high school, number six out of 300. And the, the reason I was not number one is that I failed, or I guess not failed, I got an average grade, a C, in one class. At that time, I had the highest rated radio show to the called Top 40 Radio in the state of Wisconsin. So what class do you, th- what class do you think I failed in? Communication? <laughs> Close. Speech. <laughs> Speech. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I could sit in a booth and talk to a lot of people. But face-to-face with 30 people in a classroom of my peers, I was terrible. And which kind of gives you a clue. But, you know, I called my mother. My family uh, had moved back to the South. And a phone call in those days was very expensive. And you just didn't do it. You know, you wrote letters back and forth. And But I called her to tell her that I graduated number six while holding a full-time job. And that I had been chosen by my classmates as most likely to succeed. Wow. Um, And the first words out of her mouth were unforgettable. She said, why weren't you number one? Oh. Oh, that that explains. So that kind of explains a lot about that relationship. And so I spent the next 10 years of my life making my classmates wrong. I had an early marriage and divorce. I felt horribly guilty about it. And I had had three heart attacks at 19, 21, and 23 years old. I was told that I would not live past 35. I had daily chest pain, which I lied about constantly. (laughs) And my little business was failing. And so the next significant event is that at 27, a friend of mine went out to California and attended one of the early human potential movement trainings called Mind Dynamics, MDI. Okay. Uh, He came back, told me I have to go, and I said no in every way that I could say no. And the more I learned about the class, the more I knew I didn't want to do it. However, during that six months, I watched his life transform. I saw a shaky marriage on his part become whole and complete and and incredibly supportive. I saw his business go up when mine was doing that. So I went to the training. I mean, eyes crossed, legs crossed, arms crossed, everything negative, cynical. The way I was showing up in life showed up in that training. And four days later, my life changed permanently. It sounds, you know, it sounds like a cliche all these years later. But what I learned there was about me and how I was getting in the way of my own success. And in that training, 
There's not a word mentioned about money or success or business. But hmm. in the year, in the 12 months following the training, my chest pain stopped and I tripled my income in one year. Wow. Huh. The, fo- and the following year, it went up 10 times. So that led to selling my business uh, because I got an offer to go to New York City. And I went from working with 31 people to working with 850, you know, responsible for the training and motivation of a a force of independent salespeople, 850. And so I couldn't do interviews anymore. So this was, this was right about, you know, 30 years old. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. (laughs) So big adventure for the small town kid to go to New York. Big adventure to work with that many people. So I started doing weekend seminars to motivate and focus people. And I asked the local Mind Dynamics instructor in New York to come in and do it an hour and a half with people. And then I would do the close. So I enrolled over 400 people in the Mind Dynamics training. I didn't know anything about the training except that it worked for me, for my family, for people that I sent that sent there. And, and I wasn't being paid for it. I didn't even, I knew nothing about the company. I just knew that it worked. Hmm. And uh, I was being paid on a percentage of the increase. So <laughs> if they were more effective, I made a lot of money. Okay. That's true. Yeah. So it was not a noble, it was not some noble undertaking. Right. Okay. Uh, certainly was supportive of people and I was happy to do it. And one day I got a call from the founder of MDI, a man named Alexander Everett, who introduced himself because I didn't even know his name and said, thank you, you know, because I put a lot of people into his training. And, so- and he invited me to come and meet him in California. I got to take my first first class flight when I flew from New York to San Francisco. And 10 days later, I was president of Mind Dynamics. I I took a 70% pay cut, but I was curious. And that led me on a path of being an entrepreneur in the training and coaching business. So Wow. A piece of my background. What a what a major move. Did that feel risky or did you not care about the risk? You know, I I think that you know, today I, I do a lot of work with clients around purpose, vision, and values. And one of the things we've learned about purpose is even a negative purpose can empower you if you're clear about it. So sure. my purpose, first of all, was I I will never be poor again. I'll never be poor again. Right. And, you know, after you study this stuff, you go, that has strength to it. It can be motivational. But it also has pretty profound weaknesses. Sure. Uh, when you talk about when you talk about risk, that decision was not based on money. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I mean, I gave up a lot of income to do it. Sure. It was it was the first time in my life where I realized that God had put me here for some specific purpose, and my job is to figure it out and act on it. And I wasn't sure if it was taking that job. But it just felt like the right thing to do. And so hmm. that's how that that's how that happened. I spent four years running my dynamics. The first two years running around the US kind of fixing the mess that the business was in. And remember, I had this genius, Alexander Everett, handling the content and the training of traders. Hmm. But the business was a little messy. So, so I that was on a dive into a little bit of what what was behind some of the mind dynamics but you know i think i think of that that move and and a lot of us have points in our life where we step out into an unknown and i think of you know in the bible abraham you know go to a place that i will show you and you know all all we have a sense is that 
yes, I'm supposed to go. I don't know exactly where it's going to lead. There are some clear reasons logically why I should not leave, but I just know I'm supposed to do it. And then you make that, you know, that step, which, you know, a lot of people think we're crazy, but it's just, it's just a, it's a step into who we're called to be. So, so I love that. So I'd love for you to just give it a thumbnail because I know we'll, we'll probably get into it in a little bit more depth, but I'm thinking specifically about what, where there are a couple of core things in that mind dynamics that were the kind of life changing elements around it. And do they have anything to do with kind of, I guess, the way you look at success? Because you've been successful, but I have a feeling that it's, you know, it's a much broader definition of success than what shows up on our a resume or a bio. A lot of what I do and work with people, Tommy, is using stories. So here's a story that might be part of the answer to your okay. question. Okay. Great. When I, for 20 years in doing my work, people said you should write a book about this. And for 20 years, I had a very well-crafted excuse for not doing that. You know, a book, I'm an experiential learning guy. A book is not an experience, blah, blah, blah. I, I don't know. I think part of it was low self-esteem. Part of it was laziness. Part of it was a belief that I did. I Just a whole lot of things like that. So I had 20 years of excuses. And then Stephen Covey wrote his book. Mm -hmm. and at, suddenly I learned that he had sold, at that time, 22 million copies. And that people were going to his seminar because of the book. So as a business person running a training company at that time, I thought, I am passing up a promotional opportunity so that I can be safe. <laughs> so I wrote the book. But I was really nervous. And then when it was released, you know, a few people, friends of mine, really liked it, bought copies for their families and for their companies. You know, people like Ken Blanchard... Of, of situational leadership. Hmm, Jimmy amazing Colano, guy. Jimmy Colano of Career Track and all these, you know, pretty famous people love my book. And then they would say, a lot of them would say, but I'm disappointed in one thing. So of course I would say, what? <laughs> what is <laughs> yeah. You just told me you love my book. What are you disappointed in? And it was that the book is not about me. So living an extraordinary life is not about me, yeah. Ex except for one chapter. And it okay. doesn't say, I don't identify that chapter as about me. But the, what the book is about is real life stories of people like you and me who come to the seminar, what they're confronting in their life, and how they get through that with the help of our work. Okay. So it's lots of first, it's a lot of first person stories. And the chapter that's about me, and I don't remember the exact title of my own chapter, but it's something <laughs> like the most dysfunctional belief in the world is I am not enough. Oh, wow. I am not enough. And even in my faith, by the way, I've run into that. And as recently as two or three years ago, I finally got it about grace. I didn't have a deep understanding of God's grace. I thought I had to do something to earn it. Yeah. And you could kind of see how all of this fits together, right? Yes, absolutely. So if you're the guy if you're the guy whose mother was endlessly critical and who told me that I would never amount to anything, mean that I was too ambitious, too big for my britches, another one of my expressions. Mm -hmm. That kid that kid grows up to think I'm not enough. Now, the good part of it is I translated that in my life to I'll show you. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'll prove to you. And what that brings is a great deal of accomplishment, in my case, and a very low amount of joy and satisfaction because I'm, I'm always working to prove it to somebody. Yeah. I don't know who that was. I don't know who that was, but that was my from. So what I've learned in 
working around, you know, hundred, hundreds of thousands of people, is that I am not enough is a very common belief Yes, that people hold. It leads to success in some ways, but incomplete success. And it leads to a lot of anger, a lot of resentment, a lot of cynicism, and a lot of denial of what God gave us, which is this opportunity to contribute, to live a life of purpose, of meaning, of joy, of satisfaction. And Boy, I, so, uh, I love that. that, that and, you know, there, there are a couple things that just brings to mind. One story that I will never forget that my brother told me uh, he's older than I am now, but when he was about 25, he took a year off with a friend and traveled. Uh, his friend was from South Africa and traveled around the world. And he described this one time to me when he came home, I think he was in New Zealand and he met a pastor there. And he described this time when he was, he and his friend Garth were sitting out overlooking the ocean and this pastor who was just an amazing man looked at them kind of looking out at the sea almost just speaking you know almost like a vision just he said you know if if only we could understand grace everything would change and my brother thought at that time he thought the way he's saying that just lets me know i just don't get it yet you know, this this grace thing and how important, how life-changing grace could be. And, you know, and it comes around to a book. I bet you would really love this. Our good friend suggested this. It's Seven Primal Questions. And I can't remember the author's name, but you can find it on Amazon. And one of those primal questions that shapes everything that we are is exactly the question you said, where he says, I am not enough, you know, or am I enough? And exactly what you described that when that becomes the question that shapes your life, then yeah, it can create phenomenal success, but it can create, you know, just incredible stress, pressure, dissatisfaction, depression, you know, it just can rule everything. And coming to that understanding of grace, you know, that grace is God's statement. You are enough. That's just, it's life-changing. So anyway, I'm jumping into your story, but that's, that's just, I, I think it's one of the most important questions any of us have to deal with. Well, today in the work that I do, a lot of it is around purpose, vision, and values. But in a practical business setting, what I look for is uh, three more things, which is if you have this foundation of purpose, vision, and values for your life, for your work, mm -hmm. for your organization, what you then look for is focus, alignment, and commitment from your team. Okay. You know, does everybody in the organization, do they know what you're up to? You know, the focus part. Sure. My experience has been, you know, and we did culture change work for people like Chase Bank and the Duke Energy and Progressive Insurance and you had a lot of big companies. And, you know, when you go in and interview the CEO and you say, are your people focused? Do they know what you're up to here? Oh, yes. And then they show you a coffee cup or a poster on the wall or something. Mission statement. And <laughs> then you go out, yeah, mission statement. And then you go out and inter interview the top 20 people and you get 20 different versions of what they're up to. And I'm serious. Again and again and again, we found mm -hmm. this true. You know, I, I mean, it, it's it's not a secret. We, do, we, You know, we keep a lot of things confidential in the work that we do with companies. But this was in American Bankers Magazine that with Chase. There were 32 people in the room representing 32 regions of the bank. It was the first time in the history of Chase over 100 years that those 32 roles were in the same room at the same time. 
Mm. They, they operated their business like a fiefdom, you know, like a little kingdom. Right. Where they were. And they were proud of that, that they didn't talk to each other. So anyway, focus and then alignment, which is around, and this is particularly important with younger people coming into the workforce today. And that is that alignment and agreement are similar but different. Okay. It says your agreement says you're going to do something exactly this way. Alignment means you're going to do something in consort with other people. With <laughs> some limits, there are some outside limits on that. Sure. Uh, which is ba basically purpose, vision, and values, by the way. Everybody's moving in the same direction, but in their own unique way. Or in an area that you and I are familiar with in their unique faith. You know, right. Where you, where, you know, where you have people in the workforce from uh, the Muslim community, from Buddhists, from Jewish, you know, people all over the map. But if we could get aligned to our purpose, vision, and values, and then informed by our faith, consistent with that on a personal level, we could really move this thing forward. And then finally... What's the level of commitment? You know, I have this thing called the eight principles. Uh, number eight is commitment. And when I give talks on that, what I often say is, if you ignore the first seven, but you really live commitment, you don't need the first seven. You'll figure them out. Right. That, you know, it's that willingness to do whatever is necessary to get the job done. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I I have a lot of stories from graduates from companies we've served, but I've also gone to over fifty outside trainings personally. Mm. Sometimes for me, you know, personally, this is my purpose in going there, and sometimes because it's my industry, I should know about it, right? Right. Different versions of it. So, one of the organizations that I almost ended up being the CEO of years ago was called EST, e -S -T. It's now called Landmark Education. Okay. And, and they do marvelous work. And I went to the first training because they wanted me to be the CEO. And I've always shared with people that my results from the first S training was absolute clarity I did not want to be CEO. <laughs> Sounds like that backfired for them. <laughs> there were, well, you know, I was always grateful because I learned so much about me. Right. What I wanted, what was next in my life. But after that happened and I started my own company uh, in Asia, I came back to the U.S. I flew across the Pacific to go to their advanced training. And there I met a guy named Matt Mullich. Matthew Mullich was a lawyer in his mid-30s, and his father died suddenly. His father owned a specialty trucking company that transported Broadway shows around the country or rock bands or trade show exhibits. Right. So they had an 85% market share of that very narrow niche. You know, right. They only did one thing and they did it very well. Very well. And um, in getting to know Matthew, we were both students in the training. Uh, but then we created a personal relationship over the years, and which survives till today by the way and he, he's just wonderful you know this guy was a lawyer and he takes over this co company that he knows nothing about he built it there was a duds review story on it which i have in my file somewhere cover story about his company he took it from seven million dollars a year to 85 million a year in five years wow oh, that's a lot <laughs> of growth that is a lot of growth. That's hard to do. And one of, you, know, you know, I think somebody like you and I and the color of our hair, we all remember the success story with Federal Express. That yeah. When you absolutely must have something overnight or something <laughs> like that, right? Yeah, Fred Smith, yeah. Absol absolutely everywhere overnight or something. Well... Matthew's thing was, we will not be late. Now, if you're just delivering iPhones around the country in a big truck, 
if you're two or three days later, it really doesn't matter that much. It's not a good thing, but it doesn't matter. If you're delivering a trade show that opens on a specific date, and the load-in can only take place six hours before the show, that is the same thing with Broadway shows, rock bands, all of that. So one day, I, I, this is a true story, one of his drivers was in the American Southwest, out in the middle of nowhere, and his engine blew up on his big of tractor, eight, you know, 18-wheeler. Right. And to fix it, they could not find the parts. So it was a three-day wait, which meant it, so he would have been late. So when he, when he found that out, I don't know if you're aware of this, Tommy, but if you go to a truck stop, almost always those trucks are left running. They never yeah. turn them off. Yeah, I'm aware of that, yeah. So if you go in, if you're the driver, and you go in for lunch or go take a shower, you know, and all that kind of stuff that they do in those truck stops, your truck is out in their lot running. So this guy, Matthew's employee, went out and stole a truck, disconnected it from the trailer, ended it up to his trailer, and made the delivery on time. <laughs> And then he drove to the local police department and turned himself in for, for truck theft. Wow. I think that qualifies as commitment. That's commitment. Now, when the judge heard the story, he just started laughing uncontrollably. <laughs> you know, Matthew's company had to pay a fine and stuff like that, but there's no no criminal charge. All right. Oh, that's, that's, that's great. That's a great story. That's commitment. And, and I have a thousand stories like that. So what I'm looking for in organization is what's the, what's the level of focus? What's the level of, of alignment? And then finally, what's the level of commitment? Hmm. If, we work, if we work with people on getting those to increase, a magic can happen. Yeah, you know, one of the things I've, I've found uh, fascinating is I've moved from the entrepreneurial world to – Coaching, you know, life coaching, personal coaching, executive coaching, is that the principles that worked in business, the really good principles, like you say, of, of developing, you know, purpose, vision, and values, and alignment, and commitment, that, that those principles, which the really good companies know and abide by, they also work on a tremendous level on the personal level. It the exact same principles, and yet so few people, even though they might completely believe it on the business front, would ever consider, in essence, transferring those principles into their own life and saying, well, you know, if it's important to know what your purpose is as a business, do I understand what my purpose is for my life? If it's important for my business to have really clearly stated values, do I have personal values stated? Do I have a vision for who I want to become? And, and a lot of the tools that, that you know, I've worked with are just trying to do that very simple thing of saying, you know, those principles that work so incredibly when they're truly believed and lived into with a company and not just put on a, a plaque on the wall, they are even more impactful in the individual life. So would you kind of share that? Is that, you know, where a lot of your coaching ends up going? It, it goes both ways. My, one of my coaches, and it's confusing because his name is Bob Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T, <laughs> brilliant, brilliant co executive coach. His, one of the things he shared with, now Bob Wright is like the, big fish in a small pond. Relatively. Okay. Yeah. He may he may be probably is the most successful executive coach in Chicago, Illinois. And one of the things he shared with me once in one of our coaching sessions, and you know, that's where I'm the client. Mm -hmm. and, and he said that I was talking to him about the trans what you're talking about, the translation between the personal and the organizational and he added in the family. Yes, yes. I love that. And what he said was, and he charges a lot of money. You know, it's 85000 a year. 
and, and he has a waiting list. You know, he does well. He said, so these people that pay $85,000 to him, he said, almost you can pick the day, somewhere between 90 and 100 days into their relationship, the client will, and, and there's always working on business, on business results. The business is paying that 85000 Right. You got to you got to get some results for that. 90 to 100 days later. Bob, would you mind if we talked a little bit about my marriage? Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, really really common. And so I think that it's actually three stools on that particular three legs on that stool. Yes. And that is the personal, the business and the family all need to be aligned and be operating from the same principles. Yes. You know. There's a very successful coaching organization, group coaching, called Strategic Coach. Oh, I know of it. It's a, a Dan Sullivan, right? Yes. Yes. Uh huh. And you know, did they put forty or so executives together in various cities that you meet once a month? And I participated for two years as a as a full participant. And you know, one of Dan Sullivan's points of view is that your free day, which is mostly for family, has to be identified and committed to a, in advance in your planning. And you know, when, I went to, when I went through that program, I thought, well, that won't work. I have to work seven days a week, 14 hours a day. Transformational <laughs> idea to Robert. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And his, his uh, recent book that he came out with, Ben Hardy, 10X Living, it, it expressed that Dan Sullivan sets aside 180 days a year as free days now at this stage in life. And so, you know, I guess it, you know, that seven days a week uh, should be rethought a little bit. (laughs) Well, he he started with one day a month free day. Okay. Mm -hmm. On a personal level. Right. And increased that every year. You know, it's interesting hearing you talk, and it, it certainly resonates with me. Is you know, open this episode talking about a podcast that I did just on my own uh, a few weeks ago. Find a mentor, be a mentor, and you've already described and you've been you know incredibly successful by all standards as a coach and as a trainer, and yet you've described already in this short time we've been together about four or five instances where you were the one being trained, you were the one being coached, and the people who have mentored or coached you. And I don't know, I I hope people will listen. And just to that, just by way of example, to realize that this is this is the pattern in life. We we learn from others, and we can only teach that which we've learned. We can only give that which we've received, and you know, build a life around that. Well, and you know, that's the the famous line: "Never ask a barber if you need a haircut." So don't ask you or me if if coaching is a good idea. Maybe a way to wrap this up, Tommy, is another story. This is not about one of our graduates. You know, I have a lot of graduate stories about commitment. But I spent 2015 until February 28th of 2020 in China. And, you know, I, I mean, I've lived abroad 23 years of my working life, and our biggest business was built in Asia. Okay. So I'm known there, and I, I have certain reputation and, and openings to really make a difference. And but I'm running around China, and I I've been I don't know about you, but I made a promise to myself and my family that when I travel, I'm going to add two days minimum on the front end or the back end of a trip to do nothing business related. Mm. So I got to hold a panda. Well, you know, I held a panda in my arms. In China. Ah. You know, I had right. meals. Uh, fabulous Chinese food, you know, all these things. Toured waterfalls that were beyond belief. I love waterfalls. So, yeah. And as I'm running around China, I'm seeing these huge posters advertising with this gorgeous young woman 
and she's always in athletic gear, and sometimes she has a tennis racket. But she's selling cars, she's selling cosmetics, all kinds of stuff. So I, you know, I'm with an interpreter. I can't read that what what she's doing, and so I asked the interpreter, "What what's going on?" So this this woman's name is Leon. That's two words, Lee on. Okay. And she was on the pro tour, the tennis tour internationally. And she was right around the number 100. Okay. If you're number one, if you're number 100 in the world, that's really a great tennis player. Sure. A female tennis player, you know, but your experience, that's what I learned because I had investigated this. Your experience is terrible. You lose a lot of matches. You travel with way too much luggage, including six to eight rackets. You know, and you travel coach, not first class. You probably room with another player during the matches to save money on the hotel expense. So it's not fun. Yeah. And she quit. She couldn't take it after a while, so she quit. And two years later, there was a tournament in Shanghai, which is where she went home to after she quit tennis. And, you know, at that level of any, you quit for two years, it's over, right? Sure. So, it's too hard game. So five of her friends from the pro tour went to her house and confronted her about quitting. And they basically said, you have everything it takes to be great, to be extraordinary. You hmm. need better coaching. And Leon, like so many Russian or Chinese or Iranian, there's a few North Korean athletes, they are part of a very organized system of coaching, which is generally pretty adversarial and even <laughs> cruel. Okay. So those girls, women, convinced her to get back on the tour. And they convinced her parents to mortgage their house so that Leon had five coaches. She had a coach for fitness, a coach for flexibility, a coach for technique, a coach for nutrition, and a coach for mindset. Five coaches. She won a tour event. The only Chinese tennis player ever to win a tour event, male or female. Do you know what that means in China? Oh, the, I, I mean, I mean celebrity. Uh, a, a level of fame and celebrity well, I can't even imagine. And she happened, and she happens to be gorgeous. <laughs> now, when I met whether she's wearing jeans and a t-shirt, and she's gorgeous. Uh, you know, that kind of yeah. woman. Doesn't and hurt. She blew up her knee, you know, had to quit. But now she's earning two to three million dollars a year as the face of the new Chinese female athlete, you know. Yeah. Life is very life is very good for Leon. Well it's that it that that's amazing. And <laughs> And I and I think it it goes to a point that as an introvert is even very good for for me to hear is that you know as much as I believe that you know God has a unique purpose for my life and I do believe that uh, I need need to believe equally that I'm not called and am not able to live into that purpose alone that I need others along the way and. They're just tremendous applications of that. And the extraordinary life won't come if I, if I tried to do it on my own. You know, there's a, a motivational speaker that tells this story, which might not be true, but it's a good story <laughs> okay. about the guy. He's going out for a Sunday drive in a rural area outside the city. And he comes upon what is obviously an incredible, a well-maintained and successful farm and it's the painted white fences off in the distance. He sees a beautiful barn, sees the farmer's home, sees a spotless equipment parked. 
And as he gets closer and closer, he realizes that the farmer is out by the fence. So he stops and he says to the farmer, a greeting. And then he says, God has blessed you with a beautiful farm. And the guy said, the farmer said, well, it didn't look like, it didn't look like that when God gave it to me. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, That's great. (laughs) So, you know, if I have a message for your listeners is get a coach. Well, that's great. That, you know, last question I kind of had on my list was what, what one takeaway would you leave behind? And, and I must say, that's not the one I would have expected you to give. And yeah, but, but I think it's, I think it's so true. And it's one that is important for me to hear too. So thank you for that. And I appreciate that. And just really appreciate your wisdom and sharing so much before we leave. I, I would love to give people, you know, ways to connect with you and what you're, what you're doing, what you're communicating, your book. How, how do people connect with you? The best way is through the, uh, my website, therobertwhite.com. The Robert White. Robert White. Have to add the the I in it. Love. Robert White's kind of common, like Tommy Thompson. <laughs> it's like, it's the, T-H-E. Okay. Robertwhite.com. And what you could do there is look under resources. For the last 15 years, I've done a weekly e-zine called An Extraordinary Minute with Robert White. And it's a quote from somewhere, some kind of wisdom, and my comments about it, all designed to be read in one minute or less. Oh, that's great. And, you know, and if you sign up for it, it's free. And if you comment, if you question... I read every reply. I read every reply. I respond to most of them. And what you also get concurrent with that first edition is an essay that I've been working on about extraordinary living for 30 years. It's been edited lots of times. Hmm. It does include a self-test on those eight principles and some suggestions on how to... uh, actualize them in your life so that's great it's a pdf it's shareable it's useful i recommend it also great. free so great well we will put all of that at the robert white uh, dot com in the in the show notes and so this is very helpful i'm sure a lot of people will be really interested in getting and utilizing some of those resources so robert thank you so much for your time uh, generosity with the time and Jerry, I know you're uh, getting over some sickness, and so it means even that much more that you kind of stuck with all of this. So I appreciate it so much, and I appreciate your wisdom, and I hope we'll be able to stay in contact going forward. I look forward to it also, Tommy. Thanks for uh, being a wonderful host. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Connect with Robert, and as he said, somewhere, you know, Find a coach, find a mentor, and be a coach, be a mentor, even reach out. So thanks so much, everyone, for listening, and look forward to the next episode of Space for Life. Bye-bye.